Welcome to Houston Sports Talk with your host, Robert Land. Thanks for checking into the best Houston sports podcast and welcome to our live Houston Cougars, Texas A&M NCAA tournament post-game show. Robert with Stephen Kerr and Stephen Houston sports. It's not for the weak of heart. Texans, Astros, and now add the Cougars. They just don't do things easily, do they? Oh, God, this March Madness thing's putting me to sleep, Robert. I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah, you are absolutely right about that. I, um, I'm having to do two things at once here, covering two different things. And of course, you know, my eye is very much on the Cougar game. And I come back here to the uh, to where my studio is so I can talk to you. And I guess I came back a little too early because <laughs> that's when the Aggies mounted their comeback and they go into overtime. But thank goodness the Cougars pull it out. Talk about how devastating a loss that would be, Robert, if that had happened. I mean, I remember the North Carolina State loss in the NCAA championship game in 83. That's probably the worst loss I've ever suffered. But boy, this would be right up there if Houston had lost this game tonight. Yeah, and let me just start by giving the Aggies a lot of credit. I mean, just oh, yeah. incredible heart from the Aggies from the start of this game to the finish. They put forth every bit of effort. I did not want to be an official trying to officiate this game, and we can get into that in a bit. But, Stephen, the Cougs blow a 13-point lead in regulation. Francis, Cryer, Sharp, Shed, all of them foul out. Jawan dragging around his leg like an old man with this shin injury that just won't go away. Ramon Walker left for dead a couple of weeks ago. Ryan Elvin, walk on, both those guys forced to come in and save the day. I mean, this is an incredible story. It'd be one of the great tournament games in NCAA history, except it's in the second round and it's likely to be forgotten by everybody outside of, uh, you know, over at Scott and Holman, um, you know, Cullen or whatever. Uh, yeah. The fans. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, I, you know, Robert, I know this sounds like I'm whining and I'm not. I, I'm just saying it. The officiating just seems so lopsided. I mean, you look at the first half. I haven't, you know, the game just ended, so I haven't seen the full stats or the second half stats. But I know in the first half, Texas A&M had 22 free throw attempts to only seven for the Cougars. And you had four guys, four guys with two fouls. And you had Francis with three by the end of the half. That's just absolutely ridiculous. I, I mean, come on. You know, some of the calls were were certainly worthy, but you're going to tell me that all of these guys are going to foul out and that, you know, there were some calls that I know in the first half, there was a traveling call that or a traveling that should have been called on A&M, but it wasn't. But thank goodness, you know, Houston has heart too. And listen, I'm, I'm not taking anything away from the Aggies. What you said is absolutely true. We knew this would be a tough matchup going in. We absolutely did. I mean, the Aggies almost beat the Cougars earlier in the season. I think it was in December. So there's no question that if the Cougars had lost the game, it wouldn't have been the officiating, but it's certainly worth noting. Yeah. And just, um, I'll make a note also to get in the comments. Noel, we see your comment. We're going to get to that, but really the Francis calls were the ones that upset me a little bit in the first yeah. half because no. they were very questionable. And it, that's the thing. I mean, the last thing that Cougars could afford to lose was Francis. I mean, they're short already with Tugler. Jamal Roberts, you know, I talked about it. He's dragging around his leg. And I mean, and he had two fouls too. He had two fouls at the end of the first half. So you had both your big men with, uh, you know, two and three fouls. Thank God for Emmanuel Sharp, who carried the offense for the most part in the first half, four three pointers. Sharp ends up the game. Just an incredible effort. And he was doing it on both ends of the floor like he always does. His defense, underrated, unless you watch the Cougars and you know. But if you know, you know. Sharp yeah. does it on both ends of the floor. 30 points, seven threes. And you, you, you just can't say enough about what he was able to give you because 
you know, especially with the offense needing to be better because the defense just wasn't what it typically is because of Jamal Roberts, I think, injury. And frankly, the Aggies did a, a great job because they they forced it, you know, to the center. They forced the Cougars to have to do something underneath for a team that just doesn't have the the type of depth that they they need. To, I don't think this is enough, Stephen, to carry them through this tournament. Well, I said that I think previously on a podcast, Robert, when we've talked about it. I'm just afraid that the lack of depth, as you go deeper into the tournament, is going to get the Cougars and. I think that's absolutely why the defense was not up. I mean, this was not typical of the way Houston plays defense. But you also have to remember, a and is a pretty darn good rebounding team. I mean, they're like among the top in the country, both in total rebounds and offensive rebounds. I mean, they were getting offensive rebounds, especially in the first half, that the Cougars weren't getting. And that's the reason the Aggies stayed in the game for the, for a lot of that. But yeah, you, you just, you've got so many injuries. And then, of course, you get into foul trouble. That just compounds it. So this is definitely not the Kelvin Sampson type defense that we're used to. And I think it's just with all the factors that you said. But, I, you know, as, as much heart as Houston has, you know, and with Roberts limping and, you know, Ramon Walker coming back and, and that sort of thing, it, it just still worries me that, you know, as you get deeper in, you get closer and closer to the top, that these tougher teams are going to expose – these weaknesses and the lack of depth, but you know, you got to take it one game at a time and <laughs> take a deep breath and let it out that we, that Houston did advance to the sweet 16. Thank goodness. Well, watching this game felt like two games at a time. Ooh, I don't it know. did. It really was almost two games. Yeah. This was almost three hours on the clock and thank goodness. Wade Taylor struggled, <laughs> you know, this game final score, 195 Wade Taylor was five of 25 from the field, three of 13 from three, did have eight free throws. Of course, everybody on the Aggies got to go to the free throw line a bunch, it seemed like, especially him and Radford. They combined for 20 free throws between the two of them, but they also got 13 free throw attempts off the bench from Garcia and Coleman and Carter. I mean, you look at the the box score and you just, well, well, how how did the Aggies stay in this game? You, You said it. Steven, it's free throws and Radford, 27 points, 10 of 22. Uh, missed some free throws, though, five of them. Yeah. And those were big ones, too. Yeah. And Taylor, you know, they definitely did a good job on him. He didn't score his first point until the second half, and it came on a three. That was his first basket. And I remember thinking at the time, uh oh, if he starts getting the hot hand, Houston's in trouble. Well, yeah, they did shut him down, except for, like you said, the free throws, but. Radford was the guy that that definitely kept the Aggies in the game. And that's why, Robert, I just think this has got to be an anomaly with, with this officiating is, you know, Houston's a pretty physical team. I mean, that's just how they play. And so for, for all of these fouls called, especially, I know the first two on Francis were definitely ones that I had to say, really? So let's just hope this is an anomaly going into the next game or they're really going to be in trouble. Yeah, Noel says Aggies have a history of making last-second comebacks. They That's don't right. go down easily, so not a big surprise. But, um, I mean, when you look at the tournament ahead, you know, I don't know if you go, well, they escaped a team that maybe matches up well against them. But, you know, the team that you're going to have to get through most likely, unless there's something that really strange happens, is UConn, and that's a big team. Oh, yeah. And, and, and the Cougars just aren't, you know, they're not as big as they w- once were. And so, you know, keeping these guys out of foul trouble is going to be a big deal. And But the, again, I'm going to just go back to, Stephen, I'm frustrated with the whole Juwan Roberts situations because I thought that Kelvin Sampson made a huge mistake by starting Juwan Roberts in the second half against Longwood with a 27-point lead. I don't even know why he started him in the third big 12 game, you know, after that injury, you know, of course the the shin injury in the big 12 tournament uh, looked like he aggravated it at the beginning of the second half of Longwood. They're, they're up by 27. I'm going to repeat that. Steven, if you lose a 27 point lead to Longwood without Jawan Roberts, (laughs) you don't deserve a national championship. So, I mean, I don't know what the, what, what's the thinking behind that, but Kelvin, you know, at some point, 
you got to look out for big picture and he just didn't. Yeah, it may or may not have, you know, affected the fact that, yeah, he's still limping. I, I don't know the seriousness of his injury, but yeah, it is a bit of a head scratcher. I, I don't know. You know, again, we're talking the, the depth situation, but against a team like Longwood, yeah, you wanted to make sure that you built up a, a hefty lead because look, you know, the NCAA tournament, anybody can come back and beat you. But I think the second half, he probably could have sat on the bench and, you know, rested the the leg. Whether that really affected things today, who knows? Um, but I worry about, you know, can he keep that up in the next game and the game after that if they win? And I want to go back to what you said uh, about, you know, teams like UConn who are bigger. You, you notice, Robert, the, the thing about the foul trouble, when you got both your big men in foul trouble, the Cougars had to play an even smaller ball than what they normally do, especially Zone. early in the second half. So Zone that, defense that is, too. Yeah, that's defense. Yeah, that's that's going to be a key when you get up against teams like UConn. You definitely can't afford to get into foul trouble and try to play small ball against a team like them. Yeah, and Jamal Shedd, I mean, I haven't mentioned his name, but let's go ahead and give him another great game, 10 assists, 21 points, 7 of 18 from the field. Missed all of his threes, 0 for 5. You, you need him to be a little bit better, and it would have been – Maybe a little bit easier game if he hits his threes. Yeah. Same with LJ Cryer. He was three of 10. Uh, 30% is not what you would expect. And he missed some wide open shots that you figure he's normally going to hit. So that was a little bit disappointing. Those guys are going to have to, they're going to have to be better. I mean, without 100% Roberts, without Tugler, you know, with as shallow as the Cougars are right now. You just need more. I mean, yeah. the only way you're going to win this thing is you need more from Shed, you need more from Cryer, and you need Sharp to just continue to do what he's been doing. Well, you need more consistency from all three of those guys. I mean, LJ Cryer, I've been saying this multiple times throughout the year. You know, he he's supposed to be a good shooter, and sometimes he really is, but sometimes he really isn't. And sometimes his shot selection isn't what it should be. Yeah, you've got to have the consistency from all three of those guys you know, Emmanuel Sharp lit it up. And I know, you know, in the in the second half of the Longwood game is when Sharp got going because he was pretty quiet in the first half of that game. And he finally got it going then. And he certainly had it going tonight. Yeah, Shed definitely could could have hit a few more three-pointers that would have made the difference. But how about that poster dunk that he <laughs> made in the second, late in the second half? Man, was that pretty. My goodness. Um, that's wow. one of the most incredible things you're going to see from a guy his size, six foot, six foot one. Put that on Sports Center for goodness sake. Oh, it's going to be there. Uh, you know that. Yeah. And another guy that's going to have to step up is, you know, I, I haven't mentioned this guy's name because, you know, he just he's not doing enough really this year for the for the Cougars, or at least what you would expect from him. And that's done. Done with four points. He was 0 of three from three. I mean, he he did have a big shot in the second half, as I recall, but. Yeah, you just you, you you need more from Dunn. You need more from some of the other guys. I mean, that's that's where you are right now with the depth and and that sort of thing. So you know, hopefully, um, you know, maybe this this bruise that Roberts has, uh, you know, hopefully it gets a little bit better over the next few days. But yeah, you know, playing late Sunday night, you you, you don't have a ton of time. If they're playing Saturday, you go okay. Well, that gives you you know, an extra day or whatever. Well, they would be playing Friday. They, they'd be playing Friday, and then if they win, would be Sunday. I'm pretty sure it's a Friday-Sunday tilt with with the this uh, the South region. Yeah, it would help if it was they played Saturday and but then yeah, it was a Friday-Sunday tilt, then they would have an extra, you know, extra yeah. day to work with or something. Yeah, it certainly would be nice. And uh, again, you know, we don't know what came into play of why he played in, in the Longwood game as much as he did. Uh, you know, the, the better rest, you know, the more rest, the better, certainly for him. Because you're definitely going to need him in these next games coming up. Yeah, the refs also, I mean, it, you, hopefully this is not going to happen again where Francis picks up early foul trouble and he's literally taken out of the game. I mean, yeah. that, that, that can't. That he didn't can't. even start the second half. I mean, I, I guess it was a little bit of a surprise, but then again, not. You know, he didn't start the second half because he had three fouls and he eventually did come in. So, you know, they held him out as long as they could. I had no problem with them bringing him back in with two fouls in the first half because you needed him. You needed him. Yeah, you had to.
You have I mean, to. just uh, by the way, quick heads up. Monday night, got a really good national NFL draft expert who's joining me on the show to talk Texans. So look for that. Also, check out our new YouTube shorts. I'm mixing in current clips with classic stuff from our archives. Archives, if you're new to the show, you're new to Houston Sports Talk, you're going to hear some gems from our past interviews. But uh, yeah, Stephen, I, this game, it, it, it's this is one of the classic Cougar tournament games of all time. I mean, I... You know, I don't know if it's up there with Louisville and U of H back in 83. And, the, you know, that was yeah. legendary, but that was a semifinal game. But, you know, overtime, 13-point lead. I mean, just some huge shots, you know, both sides. Uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, I don't like the, this whole thing where it's just a bunch of free throws. I mean, that that to me just kind of mucks it up and it, it's well, not no. quite as interesting. Yeah, no fan wants to see a bunch of free throws made. You want to see action up and down the court, end to end. And and that's just where I, I get, you know, I get the officials. They have to call fouls when they're obvious. I, I understand that. But this is the NCAA tournament. This isn't, you know, this isn't the CBI. This isn't the NIT. This isn't even the regular season. This is March Madness. This is, you know, this is where you shine for national TV. You don't want to be whistling every five seconds and sending guys to the free throw line time after time after time. I, I don't know, you know, what these officials, you know, that they just think they need to call a closer game. Obviously, if things are getting out of hand physically, you got to put a stop to it. But it wasn't, it certainly wasn't the case in this game. So, yeah, come on, guys, hold the whistles, let the guys play. It's the NCAA tournament. And, you know, the Cougars, as I said, are just a physical team. They're going to play that kind of style. So, blowing whistles against them. Is only going to hurt them more with with everything else they've got going on. Stephen, we've talked all year about the Big Twelve being a power conference and being the best conference in the country, and they did not have a good weekend at all. They did not. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you know, Texas bowed out. Of course, that that really didn't surprise me too much with the Longhorns. They've been such an up and down team. And listen, Tennessee's nobody to you know, there's nobody to reckon with. So. Yeah, the Big 12 definitely had some struggles, but yeah, you can be great in the regular season, but at the end of the day, you're going to count tournament games in there. That's who really comes out on top. And yeah, the Big 12 definitely struggled this weekend. Yeah, I'm I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the big picture for a second, just in this tournament, because I've been about as bored by a first weekend as I've ever been. Tons of blowouts, lack of compelling players, lack of compelling teams constant five-minute reviews and timeouts in the last two minutes. Perfect example. Speaking of a Big 12 game, kansas Sanford. It's a mountain of reviews late in yeah. that game. Yeah. But the play of the game was a blown call on an incredible block by a Sanford player. Stephen, the refs blow the call, send Kansas to the free throw line, and the irony is it would have taken all of 20 seconds on a replay to see the mistake. But you know what? With all the replays, that's something they can't replay. And it's just like, if, you, if you're still going to screw stuff up, like enough, enough with this. Like I, yeah. I'm, I'm for the NBA system. You get two challenges yeah. and, and, you know, or maybe one. And if you win that challenge, you get another challenge and that's it. I mean, this, the NCAA tournament, it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's, there's nothing really exciting to see, 30 minutes of officials looking at monitors. Yeah, and isn't it sad? We've talked almost as much about the officials on the, this live postgame show as we have the games and the players. I mean, it's just not something you want to do. I mean, it, it looks like, yeah, across the board, we're starting to see this kind of thing. And, you know, March Madness is always going to be March Madness, but I think you would have seen some much better games if the officiating had been different. And they definitely need to look at the replay system and how it works. Yeah, you, know, you want to get it right, but I would rather have fewer reviews and maybe take a little bit longer with those to make sure you get them right than, you know, a dozen or more in a game and you get most of them wrong. And just to put a punctuation mark on this tournament and how bored I have been, there were 48 games this weekend. Yeah. 11 of them were decided by less than five points. So that means, according to my math, 37. 37. Yeah. And and I, I might have that number. I might be off by one game. But, like, whatever the case is, that's 
way too many blowouts. And it, a lot of these games weren't just decided by eight, nine, seven points, six points. A lot of them were decided by 20, 15, you know. And and they want to increase the tournament to 76, really? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, exactly. this is why I, you know, this is what I, I, I think 68 is too many. And yeah, I know. And, you know, in some years you've got the upsets and you've got some really close games and that sort of thing. But I think, you know, you couple that with all the things going on in the transfer portal, you know, in the one and done years, you go to college and then you move on to the NBA or, you know, what have you. I just think all of this is starting to take a toll on college basketball, men's college basketball, certainly. And that's why I think you're starting to see some of this rear its ugly head. And I, I don't know, you know what they're going to do to turn it around, but the last thing they need to do is add more teams to the darn tournament. Yeah, it's, it's, it's <laughs> awful. And you know what? I guess the one benefit of all these stops is when Jamal Shedd's got to play every single second of the game, he gets plenty of rest. You know, he can sit down and have a cup of coffee. And, you know, when you're playing, when the last, you know, 30 minutes takes five minutes. That means he's basically standing around or sitting yeah. around a lot of the time. Yeah. That's, that's really something. As in, I didn't, I didn't even keep track of how much time that, you know, what was it last couple of minutes that they came back to the overtime, but it was a long, long time. Let me tell you. Yeah. I mean, like I, I just, you know, to me, it's like the tournament used to be one of the great events in sports and they, they continue the NCA, you know, they could screw the NCA could screw up boiling a, 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 a pot full of water. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I know. Absolutely. And, and of course they keep losing, you know, with the NIL things in court and uh, you know, all the other things. So yeah, it, it's just uh, college sports is, is definitely going through an overhaul and not all of it's good. And as I said, I think a lot of these things, are starting to leak over into uh, not just college football, but I think you're starting to see it in college basketball too. Also worth noting before we finish things out, if anybody's got a comment, jump on, but Jim Nance in the crowd cheering on the Cougs, they kept going to those shots, which was, you know, really fun. And it was just a big dichotomy, Stephen, as a Texans fan to watch the Aggies, you know, who their new big fan is, who I saw, and a lot of their crowd shots, the the new big guy on the on the Aggies side now. It's Who's that? Jack Easterby is. Oh well, wouldn't you know? Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he found a new favorite team, and um, <laughs> well, thank God it's not the Cougars. Let's just say that. Yeah, thank thank goodness. <laughs> I, I'm not big of I'm not a big you know. This might be an unpopular opinion among Cougar fans or among. A lot of people out there, but I'm not much of a Drake fan. So I know he's yeah. now all over. You know, he was at the selection uh, deal. And, you know, right. I just I he, he he can be kind of a little bit bandwagon bandwagony and a little bit annoying to me. But Nance, by the way, in the postgame show said this was all guts by everyone. And that that pretty much sums it up. Yeah, and you're absolutely right, Nance. Absolutely. I, I, I'm just interested if Jim Nance even has a voice because I mean, he's used to not having to cheer on the Cougars as loud. He's used to calling the games, but he, he, he's probably a lot louder than he normally is. Cause I can tell you um, being up with the fans and, and, and in that kind of noise, it's a little bit different than just trying to, you know, keep your composure. And when you have your headset on. Yeah. I tell you, Jim Nance is one I'm really going to miss, you know, doing a lot of those games. And I think he's going to be, doing his final masters coming up next month too. So yeah, what a, what a class guy I had the chance to interview him many, many years ago, just a, a class act, really nice guy. And just so intelligent. I mean, obviously he is, he wouldn't be where he is if he wasn't, but that's one voice we're definitely going to miss for a long time to come. One thing about the masters though, Stephen, is uh, you can lose your voice because you're just trying to whisper you, a lot. Yeah. You can just talk like this and everybody wouldn't know you have laryngitis, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We probably have some people with laryngitis after this game tonight, Robert. I'm, I think I'm surprised. Well, I'm surprised both of us are, are still talking after all this time. Oh my goodness. I, I'm surprised. Uh, I, I am not in the hospital uh, with my heart being checked out. <laughs> and I had a hockey game I'm covering too, along with this. So, you talk about double duty, man. I'm uh, 
I, I'm definitely out of breath right now. Well, we're, we're going to take off for now. Um, again, we'll have shows this week. Uh, Steven's going to join me on Tuesday. Uh, definitely want to talk some Astros. That will be part of the conversation. We're just days away from opening day. Uh, the Rockets have now moved one game away from a play-in. There wow. will be some Rockets discussion at some point this week, some way, somehow. I will try to get me a guest. But, um, hey, the Cougars and one of the great, great, Great college basketball games in history, but especially in Cougar history, pull off a uh, just an incredible gutsy win to pull this one out in overtime. Again, four guys foul out, four starters foul out of the game. Mm. They were down to Ryan Elvin shooting free throws. When was the last time you saw Ryan Elvin come in to a game? when it wasn't like a, you know, a 30 point differential. I, I don't think it, I, I wonder if it's ever happened. Yeah. I, I, if there's a cougar out there that can, can name that game, go ahead because I, I tend to doubt I it. certainly can't, but uh, we'll catch up with you guys soon. Um, and go Cougs, go Cougs. Go Cougs. You're listening to Houston sports talk. Hey, don't forget to support us by subscribing and commenting on YouTube. You can always listen to us on Spotify, Apple, or your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends about us and share our show links on social media. Spread the word, everybody. Thanks for listening.